Hello everyone and welcome to today's session of the Riot Science Club. I'm here with Lorenza and Bing, both from the Rotterdam Riot site, and we're very happy to see that so many of you have joined us today for our session in which we have Corey Horing with us. He'll tell us about working with large open source neuroimaging data sets, but before I get started with introducing Corey, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes so that everyone who wants to join but is running slightly late is able to join us from the start. In the meantime, I'd like to show you the events that we'll have in the upcoming weeks. Here you can see that on the 30th of March, our talk will be hosted at King's College London, and Theresa Wege will give a talk about racism in statistics. So be sure to mark your calendars for that at 12.30 GMT. If you want to keep posted on our upcoming seminars, you can subscribe to our mailing list, um, for which you can find the details on our websites. We'll put the links to both of our websites in the Q&A box, or I think Bing is doing that right now. If you want to join our team at one of our sites, or if you want to set up your own site, also feel free to contact us about that. Just before we get started, a last bit of housekeeping. Maybe you're very familiar with it by now, but all of our events are hosted on MS Teams Live Events, which is a one-way streaming service, but of course we always love input from our audience. So if you have any questions either during or after the talk, don't hesitate to ask those in the Q&A box. Bing, Lorenza and I will monitor this Q&A and try to address as many questions as we can. Please note that you can also upvote the questions that you would like to be addressed. And lastly, if you joined late, uh, you can start from the beginning or if you have the feeling that during the talk you want to pause or rewind, you can also do that. All right, I think it's time to move on to the session of today. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker, which is Corey Harin. And Corey is an MD PhD student at Yale School of Medicine in the lab of Todd Constable. And his research focuses on individual differences in functional MRI data in the developing brain in health and disease. He wrote a paper, A Hitchhiker's Guide to Working with Large Open Source Neuroimaging Datasets, which was recently published uh, in Nature Human Behavior. And that's also what he'll talk about with us today. <coughs> of course, we'll post a link to the paper and the preprint in the Q&A too. And as someone who works with large neuroimaging data sets, I remember very well that at the beginning, these huge data sets were quite daunting to me. And even now that I've become slightly acquainted with them, I'm still looking for the best way to explain to others that they're not as scary as they may, might, might look at first. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Corey's talk today. All right, I think without further ado, that's it for me. So then, Corey, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. I am gonna share my slides here. Um, Thanks. Okay. Whoops, okay. Okay, can you all see my, my first slide? Yes. Okay, great, uh, cool. Okay, um, thank you everyone for having me. This is wonderful. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Um, as you heard, uh, the, the title of my talk is A Hitchhiker's Guide to Working with Large Open Source Neuroimaging Datasets. So here's an outline of what I'll discuss uh, today. I'll talk a little bit about the power and challenges of working with these large open source datasets. Um, I'll discuss how to best obtain and manage these data. Um, I'll provide some tips about getting to know your data as soon as we're getting started. I'll touch on how to best communicate results, and then I'll finish up with a discussion of some emerging issues and final remarks um, for us to consider as a field. Uh, just a note about the scope of today's talk. Um, I've, as was said, I'm gonna be um, essentially working, walking you through this paper. Uh, this was published a couple, couple months ago, and um, everything I talk today is going to be, <laughs> I talk about today is gonna be drawn from this. So I'd encourage you to Check this out if you want more information, and we go into a little bit more detail in the manuscript. Uh, today, it's all about practical tips. I won't be presenting any new results or new data. Um, these are just hopefully <laughs> easy to follow suggestions that can help you get started. Uh, I'll point to resources that you can use at various aspects of the data life cycle. Um, I won't really focus on any resource in particular. Instead, I'll just kind of nudge you to certain software tools, things like that. Uh, the, the tips I'm going to talk about today um, are pretty uncomplicated. <laughs> and what I mean by that is these are things that 
Um, as researchers, we've been told uh, since getting our start in research and the, the tips themselves aren't that hard to implement or they're not that complicated to follow, but because of that, they can be they can be easy to forget. And when you're getting started, it's almost <laughs> some of these just basic things like documenting what you did to the data and just keeping a lab notebook, you, you can forget simple steps like that. So these tips are pretty straightforward, but I just I think it's worth it to highlight them all in one place and uh, provide this resource for you to, to hopefully use when, when getting started. And I won't make any um, analysis recommendations per se. I'll touch on this towards the end, but um, yeah, it's more just kind of things to think about rather than strict recommendations. And uh, I think I can get through this in about 30, 35 minutes, so I'd love to uh, hear your questions throughout and uh, hopefully we can have discussion after. So yeah, there should be plenty of time for, uh, for a proper discussion. Um, okay, so uh, the power and challenges of large open source data sets. Um, these, these resources that our field has are just, these are just amazing things that we as a community have at our disposal. Uh, things like ABCD, UK Biobank, HCP, these are wonderful resources that any single lab to collect in isolation would take a long time. So the fact that these are, um, these data sets are released and open to people to use, I mean, it's just a really cool thing. It's the, the hard eyes emoji, that's what comes to mind. It's just, this is a really, these, these data sets provide just a really cool thing that we as researchers can work with. Uh, and I think just generally the, the fact that these data sets are released and available for all, all to use, it just points to how I think our field has done a tremendous job of practicing open science and putting that at uh, the forefront of what we do. So this is just a great thing for our field. Uh, I think <laughs> one of the primary reasons for the heart eyes emoji is just the statistical power. Um, we can tackle questions and think about things that we previously haven't been able to and just uh, the statistical power is just an awesome thing. Um, but if what I what I just described, I like to think about as sort of the poetry of big data. Uh, we tend to think about what we can do with these data. We use beautiful metaphors and soaring language to to describe kind of planned analyses. But if that's the poetry of big data, uh, the challenges and kind of simple organization things I like to think about as the pros of big data. Um, and if you're not careful about these things, these data sets can cause you really big problems. And if you're not careful, it's the crying eyes emoji. It can make you really sad. So uh, that's, <laughs> I'll, I'll touch on some of these, these problems and ways you can hopefully avoid them. And uh, yeah, and I think another thing, as was, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, getting started can be daunting. When you're dealing with thousands and thousands of scans, it can be a little scary to just get started. So um, hopefully today, some of these tips can just help, help you uh, get your feet wet. And lastly, uh, these resources, um, the processing of them and working with them can cost a lot of time and money. So if, you, if you're not careful and if you're not thoughtful about how you're structuring your time and working with these data sets, it can be a really big investment. So the, the hope is today some of these tips can save you some time and money. Um, OK, so the first step uh, when working with these samples is obtaining and managing data. Uh, so the first question, <laughs> And this is very straightforward is you need to identify the data that you want and in particular you should think carefully about uh, the research question and this is this is one of those things that is very obvious but um, I think the tendency with working when, when working with smaller samples is just to, to get everything we'll download every data modality that is available and we'll just we'll get it all and then we'll figure out what to do with it later but that can <laughs> that sort of brute force approach can end up costing you a lot of time. It, it can oftentimes be difficult to store those data. So if you think carefully, carefully about what you want to do, it can just help focus your work. Uh, think about your processing needs. Um, with some of these really large samples, you need uh, pr pretty powerful computational uh, pipelines. And it's just something that you need to think about that maybe in the past you probably could get away with not thinking that carefully about. Also think about timeline. Um, if you're starting from scratch and working with ABCD or the UK Biobank data, um, and if you're a master's student, for example, maybe it makes sense to um, start with the process data instead. Um, it can just take a long time to um, process, process the data and get things into 
a form that's ready for analysis. So just think about your own timeline as well as the timeline of the lab. And this is just an example of things to think about when you're getting started. Um, the, the, the point is you should think carefully about lots of things that will just help focus you as you as you um, try to download the data. Um, also think about <clears throat> some of the requirements in terms of IRBs and um, HICs. It's overlooked, but sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes you do need to um, apply for approval from your own institution. So just be aware of that. You might have to do some paperwork before even downloading data. And also think about what's required in terms of external approval. Some samples that I'll highlight in a second are really open. You can download them in a day or two and get started. Others, you need to submit a formal application and a data usage agreement. So just be aware um, that this might be your, might be a requirement. Uh, in terms of what's out there for open source samples, um, I think this is figure one from our paper. Here we're listing um, open source data sets. The, the rows are these different samples. We've arranged them in increasing order here in terms of sample size. Um, sorry, here is uh, a legend. Here's here are the different types of data modalities. Um, and uh, here's a column indicating data level and then this is the access of the sample. So in terms of data modalities, you can see that most of the samples, all the samples that we've highlighted here have structural data, all have resting state. Um, some have task data indicated here with the T. Um, most tend to have, all of them tend to have uh, behavioral data, whether it's just basic demographic information or more uh, rich behavioral characterizations. Um, yeah, so this is just a resource um, to use when thinking about what data you might want. Uh, the data level indicates um, the small white circle indicates primary data. So as you can see, all of these samples have DICOM or Nifty images. Um, quite a few have some form of pre-processed data, whether that's um, a skull script image or some form of processing that's been done. Um, and most of them have some form of process data, whether this is an activation map or a connectivity, uh, connectivity matrices for subjects. Um, yeah, and the, the access, sorry, I lost my mouse here. Okay, the access um, one indicates no restriction. With these, you can, in principle, get started right away. You can go to the website and download, download the data and jump right in. Um, this stands in contrast to the, the level four. Here we've indicated that um, requires a formal data usage agreement and approval by the, by the database committee, if you will. Um, so this is just a resource to, to think about when uh, thinking about what you want to get started. In terms of uh, other resources, th this is just a collection of um, open repositories. So we've listed the repositories here in the rows. Uh, you can see the number of open data sets listed in this column. Um, here we're highlighting particular large data sets of interest. You can see Abide is hosted on a few of these. Um, uh, NKI is hosted on a few of these as well. Same sort of data level um, designation is listed here. Um, all of them have primary data except NeuroVault, uh, which is available for, for hosting and um, downloading uh, process data. And again, this is just the access level listed so that you can consider um, what needs to go into obtaining the data that you want to work with. In terms of what to download, um, a key decision point is the imaging data type. So here, what we're talking about is raw data, whether it's uh, DICOMs or NIFTIs or some sort of some form of process data. A uh, key thing to think about here is the storage needs. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to analyze uh, connectivity matrices in ABCD, um, just the the raw primary data um, without any form of processing is about 14 terabytes uh, from all the structural data and the functional data, um, and that's not accounting for any sort of uh, storage of intermediate files, like I said. And if you if you download the pre-processed data um, and get matrices for each subject, I think this is the Gordon parcellation. This is about 25 megabytes. So you can see there's a really substantial difference here, and it's just something to consider when figuring out if you want to work with raw data or process data. Uh, time is another thing to consider as well. It just it takes time to process the data, QC the data. Um, jump over any hurdles that you might encounter. So just think carefully about that. Um, in our experience, it can take six to seven months to process about 5,000 subjects from ABCD. So it just takes some time. So it's something to think about. 
and flexibility um, inherent. <clears throat> excuse me, inherently when you choose a form of process data to work with, you are tied to the processing um, choices that went into generating those data. Whereas if, if you work with the, the raw data, you have a little bit more flexibility to tailor things how you want, and you can look at the impact of different processing choices, et cetera. Um, okay, in, in terms of organization and documentation, this is critical step in working with these samples. Um, in terms of storage, bids is at this point becoming increasingly common in the field. Uh, so I'll point you to these um, starter kit here. And um, I will say, I think some of these samples um, come with a predetermined data structure already. So in, in some cases, it might not be, um, you might not have to organize things into bids if there is a structure that is sufficient for your needs, but just something to think about. Um, in terms of documentation and communicating with other lab members that might be working uh, with you on, on, on a project, uh, things like Jupyter Notebooks, um, a Google Doc, Slack, all of these are effective means of communicating with team members. Um, doesn't matter, <laughs> in my opinion, what you use. Just the key point is that you're documenting what you did to the data and why. And I think a particular point that might go unappreciated is um, Organ organization and documentation are critical given that younger personnel often tasked with working with the data move on. People defend their, their theses, postdocs move on, and if things aren't clearly documented, it can be a real challenge figuring out what, were done, what was done to the data and why. So just be thinking about this when uh, getting started with the project and, and just know that people move on in, the, in, in their training. Um, okay, and for, so for this section, the closing thoughts, um, some other tips basically are check for updates, uh, whether this is a, a QC wiki or a, some sort of forum or an email list, um, it's not enough just to download the data and forget about kind of the sample. You need to um, be aware that bugs might be discovered in, in, in these data sets or other updates might be out there, so just keep apprised of what's happening with the sample and um, yeah, just pay attention to that. Team up when possible. <laughs> I found a cheesy stock image here indicating that you should team up and whether this is within your own lab or institution, um, in, in our experience, it's helpful to have two to three people working on processing a large data set. Uh, you could also work um, across labs. The point is try to work together whenever possible. The key point, however, is just make sure that um, the paperwork is done that allows you to do this. If the, the, the data access re requirement um, in, requires that like everybody needs to be listed on the data usage agreement, you need to <laughs> ensure that that's done before other people access the data. Um, file permissions are a key thing if, if you're going to team up. Um, if somebody's going to be involved in checking skull stripped images, a, a younger team member, for example, read only permissions are probably sufficient. Um, if somebody accidentally deletes files, it can be a pain to start over. So just think carefully about that as well. And then ask, ask questions. Uh, Twitter is a great resource for um, putting questions out to the community. And in, in my experience, people have been really helpful in terms of answering questions and uh, yeah, sharing information. So uh, the, the key point is just um, yeah, ask, ask questions. Um, okay, so we've talked um, a little bit about obtaining and managing data. The next step is um, getting to know your data. So um, a good place to start is just look what's there in terms of demographic and participant factors. Things like age, sex, race, and family structure. Uh, family structure, particularly in HCP, has been shown to affect analyses. So get a sense of the data landscape with respect to these factors. Um, calculate things like descriptive statistics. Look at um, visualize your data, get a sense of, of what's going on. Uh, and I think it's important to do this before and after QC just to get a sense of your sample as a whole. Uh, be aware that side effects are something that you um, you might need to account for in your analyses. Uh, data sets like Abide, UK Biobank, uh, ABCD, these samples comprise multiple sites. Um, so just be aware that this is something you should, you should consider. Um, other confounds can play um, a role in these larger samples. Uh, Thomas Yeo's group showed that in HCP, time of day um, has uh, plays, plays a role in uh, global signal, I believe they looked at. Um, and just, yeah, other things like the time of year someone was scanned, smoking status, um, things that you normally might not think about with smaller samples. Um, just be aware that these might be playing a role in your data. 
uh, this I'm listing here um, this really great resource. Uh, it walks you through kind of how to get started with data exploration techniques and also provides um, some toy data and code. Uh, so when I show these slides, yeah, this is a great resource to to check out. Um, in terms of uh, this is an imaging talks, <laughs> you need to get to know the imaging basics. Um, things like basic imaging parameters, of course, you need to know those, but also um, be aware that all subjects maybe haven't didn't complete a scan fully. Maybe a participant got out of the scanner halfway through and um, yeah, so be on the lookout for something like that. Be aware if a participant had to repeat a scan. Um, there might be. Yeah, this just might be something that if you collected the data yourself, you would know this, but given that you didn't collect the data, just be aware that this maybe occurred. Uh, be on the lookout for things like um, the effects of different scanner types, uh, software upgrades, things like this can occur over the course of an open uh, open data set release. Um, look into whether this, the participants were scanned in the same day or whether they were back to back sessions. Just think about that um, and I'll point you to this paper from uh, the Oxford group. Um, this is a really this awesome resource, Tour de Force, uh, about the impact of confounds in UK Biobank. So this is just a really great uh, paper to read and just, yeah, good to, good to think about context, uh, confounds in the context of the UK Biobank. Um, okay, in terms of um, other imaging stuff to know about task specific factors, um, and I'll just say we're, we're pointing these out just to provide examples of things to be on the lookout for. So in our experience in the HCP S900 release, uh, the working memory task in this RL run, um, we observed 30 participants had a different block order than what was reported for a majority of the participants. Um, and this is something that a lab member found when working with the data. And uh, yeah, so it's just sometimes things like this happen in the course of the study and doesn't preclude the use of these data, but it's just something uh, to be on the lookout for. Um, in addition, in HCP, in the emotion task for some subjects, the last block terminated early, but the task regressors released don't reflect this. So um, the point is just this is, and I think this is documented on the HCP website, but just be aware that things like this can occur and um, look out for these and other samples that you're working with. Um, in ABCD, uh, in the sustained stop signal task, um, it's been reported that some of the stimulus have different durations. Um, some stimuli are, are even missed. Um, so just be aware that this is a, this is a specific thing in ABC, ABCD that might affect your analyses. Um, and in, in addition, there are differences across samples. This is kind of intuitive. These samples, some of these open data sets like weren't coordinated, wasn't the point of them. But oftentimes we use different open source samples as test data sets, or you might compare results kind of when reading papers and stuff. But it's important to note that even um, studies that use the same task might have differences. So for example, in the working memory task across HCP, ABCD, and PNC, um, different type of task was used across these samples. The stimuli were different, as you can see here. Um, timing parameters were different across these samples. And yeah, so the point is, um, again, just if you're working with multiple open source samples, uh, be aware that things are going to be different and just account for that in your analysis plan. <clears throat> um, OK, so one of the last things to, to know when working with um, these open source samples is uh, behavioral measures. Um, a lot of us, myself included, are interested in brain behavior relationships. In 2020, there were 1,200 papers um, that I found that were fit the criteria uh, for this PubMed search. So, I think that a lot of us are interested in this and it's not enough to just focus on ensuring the imaging data are high quality. You need to think carefully about uh, the behavioral data as well. Um, so as an example of things to just be aware of in specific cases and provide you um, kind of in, in, with an idea of things to be on the lookout for in Abide, um, the ADOS version that different sites used, uh, the, the version differed across sites. In addition, the administration Differed as well, in, in that some only some sites had research certified staff administering the ADOS, and some sites did not. So this could potentially impact analyses. Something to be aware of. Um, in addition, in Abide, the the IQ scores released. Uh, different indices were used to generate the IQ data, and different versions 
of different indices were used, so just be aware of this as well. Um, between data set differences are something to uh, be on the lookout for as well. And just again, think about this if you're using um, samples as a test data set, for example. So in fluid intelligence, um, in the HCP sample, a 24 item of fluid intelligence was collected, whereas in PNC, um, a 24 and an 18 item uh, index was used. <clears throat> and when you're working with these, these behavioral data, there are lots of different scores that are released. Um, raw scores are released, summary scores, different subscale scores. Um, also, some of these are standardized. So just, yeah, ensure that the data that you're working with, that's actually what you intended to use. Um, the closing thoughts for this section, uh, descriptive statistics, visualization, <clears throat> These are just key things to do when getting started. Uh, search for things like missing data, outliers. Um, yeah, do that as well. And then again, here's the link. Uh, this is a really just great resource, so I'd encourage you to check it out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, OK, so we've talked about um, tips for obtaining and managing data, um, moved on to getting to know your data. Uh, the last step is communicating results uh, from the data that you've worked with. Um, so in terms of what to report, uh, the COBITAs, um, uh, yeah, COBITAs is a great place to start. Uh, this paper here is the citation for COBITAs. Uh, this is a really great overview and just a really thorough, <laughs> exhaustive uh, list of things to include when you're analyzing data and sharing data and writing stuff up. So I'd encourage you to check this out for like a really great overview. Um, in terms of things that are important when working with big samples. Um, I think it's important to um, document the data release. You can't just say you're working with H HCP. You need to indicate the specific release that you're working with, whether it's the S900 or S1200 release. Um, also, in some cases, it's really helpful to report the data obtained. In ABCD, for example, um, the fast track images are released monthly. And if you um, report the date that you downloaded those data it can be a useful timestamp to report and just give other researchers a sense of the sample that you're working with. Um, it's great to share the subject IDs. This can just help uh, really clarify and make transparent the exact sample that you're working with. Um, however, if you want to share those, you just need to ensure that you are able to share those in the data usage agreement. Um, OK, so in terms of what to share, um, intermediate forms of data, if, if you're able and um, if it's allowed, these, these can be great resources for other researchers to work with, um, whether it's within your own institution or collaborators. Um, data derivatives and results are also, are also great. Um, things like parcellations or network labels. Um, NeuroVault is a great resource for this. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's, there are a lot of cool data on NeuroVault already, so I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, but again, just check the data usage agreement and ensure that you are actually allowed to, <laughs> to share um, these, these data forms. And code, it's really important to share uh, processing and analysis code. GitHub is um, a great resource for this. And uh, yeah, just the point is to uh, be open and, and be transparent and, and share uh, code if you're if, if, if able. Um, OK. Um, Another important aspect of communicating results is um, thinking about uh, reproducible inference. So um, yeah, effect sizes. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot written recently about um, just kind of how big data can present a unique set of statistical challenges. Um, I won't belabor it here, but uh, Steve Smith and Tom Nichols wrote this uh, piece in Neuron. This is a, just a great overview of things to think about. Um, when working with larger samples and some of the, the issues that can arise. Uh, I won't belabor any uh, certain statistical argument or thing now, but I'll just point out, uh, ideally, you should have multiple um, kind of avenues of converging evidence, and it's important to think about biological and practical significance. Um, yeah, the, the, the power of these samples is what makes them so great, but you can also, um, unfortunately, be led astray if you're not thinking critically, so just don't turn off your brain and think carefully about, about your data and results and ways to yeah get at different lines of converging evidence. Um, and I won't belabor this as well, but it, it can be really useful to report negative results um, 
when used with these larger samples, it's just a good thing for the, the, the literature as a whole. Um, the closing thought for this section is pretty simple, just transparency is the key. Um, the, the more stuff you share, the better, and it can just, yeah, help clarify exactly what you did and can help with um, re reproducibility and potentially generalizability. So just be, be as transparent as possible. Um, okay, so we've covered uh, these different steps of the data lifecycle, uh, obtaining imagined data, getting to know data, and communicating results. Um, these are kind of practical tips. That was the, the theme of these points. Um, this final section, I just, I'll hit on a few issues that I think we as a field need to keep thinking about um, with respect to these samples. Um, okay, so the first item is data decay and generalizability issues. Um, and I think this has been written about in, in a couple of different uh, papers and the ideas are, um, yeah, they're maybe a, a slightly different paper to paper, but I, I love this this quote from uh, the Steve Smith and Tom Nichols neuron overview. Uh, and they use Alzheimer's disease and ADNI as an example. So the quote is, every publication in imaging biomarkers to predict AD is based on ADNI. As more and more researchers base their findings on the same ADNI data, generalizability becomes a concern. Will the 100th paper reflect overfitting to idiosyncrasies of the sample. So I think it's just uh, it's useful to think about that this this notion. If we're all analyzing the same data, um, the utility of the data might decrease over time. Um, and I think this points to the importance of collecting new data. Um, yeah, both in terms of just providing a training opportunity, running your own study and designing your own study and scanning the subjects yourself can be a great way to just it's, it's a wonderful training opportunity. Um, and the, the, the aspect that relates to generalizability is scanning new participants. Um, we need to continue to stay relevant as a field and um, collect new samples and just keep studying people in the current day. And um, aggregation of smaller samples is a really effective way to get big samples. A bide was, is, is basically this approach. So yeah, it's important that we uh, keep collecting data and keep sharing data and just adding to the, the open data ecosystem. Um, yeah, so I believe that's it. <laughs> here's here's my summary. Um, I've talked today a little bit about some of the power and challenges of working with large samples, um, giving you some tips on obtaining and managing data, hit on getting to know your data, uh, touched on communicating results, and then uh, discussed a few emerging issues for, for our field. Um, so I'd like to thank the co-authors uh, on the paper, in addition to uh, my PI, Todd Constable, um, other Constable and Shinos lab members, and uh, here's my funding. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Corey. That was a really nice overview uh, uh, of your paper, and I highly encourage everyone to also read it if you uh, want a more in-depth view of this. Um, we already have some questions and uh, the first one that we have is by Sashi and uh, they ask, do you have any tips or suggestions for dealing with differences in behavioral data between sites or studies? Yeah, um, between sites or studies. I, I think, I mean, it depends on <laughs> your specific analysis, analysis plan and your needs and your goals, but I think um, the generalizability part here i think you can if you're clever you can use that to your advantage you know and if you have different indices of interest and if you structure your analyses in a way you know you can potentially use one sample as discovery sample and then the other sample as a test data set you know and i i think that the argument could be made that if that relationship holds in those two different contexts in in my mind that would strengthen the the finding uh if if that's what you want to do. However, if, if that isn't what you want to do, you could um, hopefully use the, the overview figure that we provided to point you to samples that might have uh, behavioral indices a little bit more closely aligned. So yeah, I think those are some good options. Yeah, I, th I think that's a brilliant answer. I, I tend to agree with you that indeed, if you have different measures that uh, attempt to measure the same construct, then it's essentially stronger if it if the associations hold across different measurements yeah. uh, for the same construct, but then if they don't, it all becomes a bit more tricky. But exactly. yeah. yeah, that's a challenge. <laughs>
Um, thank you, Corey. So the next question is from Etienne, uh, and it is how can you estimate the size of a given data set before downloading it? Are sizes reported accurate? Um, that is a great question. So sorry, the first part of that was how can you simulate the size? Estimate the That's size simple. of yeah. a given data set, yeah. yeah. So, so all of the most, I think, yeah, I think all the samples that I listed in that figure, I'll just go to that quickly. Um, have in on the on the website the the the, the sample size currently or previous data releases on the sample size. Um, so that that's a good thing to check out. Also, the some of the the, the papers that report the release of these samples have um, sample sizes listed there. Yeah, but I, I think that that's a great point. It is important to be aware that yeah sometimes um for whatever reason there might be a slight discrepancy between what's reported and what you actually download so it's really important to pay attention to that and yeah maybe whether it's a qc issue that was discovered or some other thing that has caused what's reported and what you actually get to diverge it's 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 important to pay attention to that because they can differ yeah perfect thank you um I see for now we don't have any new questions. Um, so we encourage the audience to post uh, new questions. And in the meantime, I was actually wondering, you know, regarding this um, data, uh, data set size, what could we do uh, when we submit a register report, for instance, on this? And the might, you know, usually power calculations are required. And uh, if that's the case, how could we um, reconcile this difference between uh, the estimate of the size that we obtain yeah. at the beginning versus the one that we actually have later on. Yeah, that's a good question. I, yeah, I think um, if you don't have the data in hand, all you have to work with is what's reported. <laughs> I think it is good to base your initial power cal calculations off that, but you could potentially put in language in the in your report about how this may differ due to a variety of issues and that you will account for that <laughs> and think carefully about that in your analysis plan. Yeah, I think that, that's one option. Perfect, I think in the meantime, uh, questions have are coming in again, uh, so keep posting them and otherwise we'll continue to spam you, Corey, with our own questions because we have plenty too. <laughs> Um, so we have another one by Ichen first, because I'm going to give privilege to the ones asked by the audience, and that is, are there any tools or protocols that you recommend to download your data? For example, our clone or SCP? Yeah, um, I don't have any particular favorites. Yeah, <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, I, I think I don't have any particular tool to recommend or any best approach, but I think um, I'll offer a somewhat pedantic <laughs> general answer is that that it just yeah downloading the data can be a challenge whether network connections are are interrupted or you know things like that can occur. So I think that it's not as simple as just hitting a button you know or like <laughs> entering a command that that is that that can be a pretty but that can take longer than you'd expect. So I don't have any specific things to recommend, but yeah, it, it, I mean, that is something that can take a little bit longer than than hoped. And um, yeah, it's you, you you don't just get the data in an hour, you know, like sometimes it can, it can take a while and yeah, it's important to like think about how to best do that. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's such a hand wavy answer, but I that's, <laughs> the best I can, best I can do right now. Yeah. No, that that is completely fine. I was actually wondering uh, because at the beginning of your talk you said, okay, you can go if you want to download the data, you can go with the raw data or minimally or pre-processed data. Um, you have probably downloaded a lot of uh, open source neuroimaging data sets. What do you yourself tend to use most often? What do you download? Yep, we tend to use um, primary data in the Constable Lab. Yep, and um. And yeah, and we also between yeah, our labs and collaborating labs have also looked at um, some of the and played with some of the process data. But yeah, we tend to start from the primary data and um, 
just as, as a default. And uh, yeah, that's, that's our, that's our go-to, I'd say. Yeah. And, and why did you make that decision? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I don't want to speak for anybody else in my lab, but um, yeah, I, I, like, like I said, in terms of just the flexibility, I think that's probably the, the, the overarching motivation. Um, so with the ABCD data, we've generated connectivity matrices, we've looked at um, things with respect to individualized parcellations, and because we have the intermediates and because we have the raw data itself, we, we can, we have the flexibility and we can go back and reprocess things and we've looked at different group parcellations, you know, and it's just, yeah, it, without the primary data, it would, wouldn't have been possible to do that. And um, so I think that's the primary reason, just the flexibility itself. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense. And it is probably even uh, handier when you download multiple open source data sets because probably they're not processed in exactly the same manner. Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. And, that, and that's that's a great point. Um, so some of the connectivity matrices might have across the different open source samples might have different parcellations, for example. And if you want to, like you said, look at um, kind of generalizability like aspects, it would be helpful to sometimes have things aligned, sometimes not. So the having access to the primary data affords you that flexibility. Yeah, for sure. Well, if if I may go on, and I'm pretty sure that Lorenza is burning to ask the same question. Um, so if you use um, neuroimaging data that has been collected across different sites or even across different samples, um, one thing that I find particularly hard is how I can correct for um, scanner side effects. So when people are scanned on different scanners, there tends to be a bit of variability in the measures. And I think there's a lot of ways how you can go about it. Do you have any advice there? Yeah, so I, in the paper, we talk about that quite a bit. Um, I, it's, yeah, <laughs> I think we hit on that quite a bit in one section. Um, so things like combat, depending on your analyses, uh, your analysis goals. Um, things like combat can be useful. We do, um, we tend to do predictive brain behavior association type studies. So one thing that we've come up with is you build a model on all the sites except one, and then you have a, a left out site to test your model. And then you iterate through that and kind of leave each site as a, as a holdout sample. So that's, that's another way. Um, yeah, I think it's important to look before analyses if sites are different from other sites, you know, and if there are outlier sites or, yeah, I think um, the side effects are, can be hard. <laughs> yeah, and it's the sort of thing that um, when some of the samples I've worked with in the past, this, this, this some smaller open source samples, um, they do not have side effects and you haven't had to <laughs> think about it, but it, it's a new wrinkle, I think, given the nature of some of these, these data sets. So I think it's, yeah, it's a really important issue. It's it's analysis dependent, but there are tools and, and ways to get around it for sure. Thanks. All right, I see we have another question from uh, the attendees. So this is about data storage. So where do you store your data, especially when it is uh, a large set? So more than one uh, terabyte. Yeah, we have uh, resources in the lab, so we store stuff on the cloud. And um, yeah, and then we tend to do like all of our processing there. And then when it's time for analyses, we and this this varies a little bit by within our own lab as well. But um, we tend to store like ABCD on the cloud, and then we we run analyses locally if if it's not too computationally intensive. Um, so yeah, storage is on the cloud, and then analysis is kind of however best fits your own analysis pipeline. So that's 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 what we do. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I I know, for instance, that also in our lab uh, we use uh, different types. Well, we could use our uh, servers. So these are usually. Um, in, it's usually your institution or your lab that provides this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hopefully that can help uh, for future researchers as well. 
in the meantime, perhaps, uh, Elizabeth, we can slip in a few of our questions as well. <laughs> And um, yeah, you know, I, I think it was really interesting how you mentioned some challenges towards the end. Um, and I wondered if you, uh, which which particular challenges you had encountered? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the, wow, yeah. <laughs> I think for me, the, the biggest challenge uh it's getting started and <laughs> just jumping in i was certainly one of the ones intimidated about where to even start so so that that can be difficult and also i think and i think this may hopefully came across a little bit in the presentation and it's in the paper i think a little bit but just the just it takes a long time to work with these samples and and you run into issues that you didn't anticipate and i think that's just a, a consequence of some of these bigger data sets, you know, and, and uh, in, in particular, the, the processing can take a really long time. And, you, you, you know, you start out and you're so excited and you just want the data now and you want to play with it, <laughs> but it just, it takes a long time and it, it takes a lot of work. So I, I think I, that is a challenge that's specific to me and my personality. Uh, yeah, so that's, those are the two biggest things I'd say, the, the getting started and then just the the patience, I would say. Those, those are still challenges for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are good points. Um, and, you know, we've also these very large uh, data sets that are open. Um, there are other challenges that I can imagine are arising in the field, such as, um, for instance, the fact that there might be duplication of resources, duplication of research questions being examined and so on. How do you, um, how do you suggest um, trying to prevent this resource duplication and trying to create instead more of a collaborative uh, situation where individuals with the same interests work together? Yeah, wow, that is, that's a great question. I, I think the and I wish this wasn't so hand wavy, but the the working the, the the teaming up is and asking questions is key. And I think that oftentimes, given the challenge of these samples, there's just this tendency to want to maybe just keep things in house or or not to figure things out on your own, you know, and and just to kind of work independently. But yeah, I think I, I wish I had better tips, but just the reaching out to people. I think that um labs are recognized what a big challenge some of these samples represent and a lot of um challenges that previously you could kind of get around within your own lab a, a lot of people are recognizing this and all it takes is is reaching out in in my experience in, in some cases and um yeah people are hopefully willing to work together and uh yeah <laughs> share in, in my experience but it's it's tough like you said um there are i think yeah kind of aspects of research that make it tough to do that and certainly don't incentivize that so that's that's tough but um in in our experience working with these samples people are willing to share knowledge and have have been open to helping each other out so i i think just the the getting started part is the key asking questions and okay questions. yeah that's wonderful to hear i wonder how you identified the the researchers that could be your collaborators in this in in your projects in terms of outside of your lab of course yeah um yeah so i i can only speak to yeah like our experience here at, at yale but yeah people are people are open about ABCD in particular, that's that's kind of the, the data set that I've helped process and, and work with the most. And um, yeah, just through seminars and talks, um, I think you get a sense of who at your institution is working with what data and um, people here are open to collaborating. <laughs> and and um, yeah, and I think it's just if you if you have a good sense of kind of what's happening within your own university or institute, um, it's yeah so, uh, it can be as simple as shooting someone an email and having a coffee and just 
learning more about what they're up to and yeah, ways you can help each other out. I really like that you uh, have experienced this as such a collaborative effort uh, because I think that we all want uh, to have these collaborations. And what I also really liked was that you point out that reaching out is uh, an option via, for example, Twitter um, and also via the fora, of course, that, uh, for example, ABCD study has if you run into issues with the data. And I was wondering for people who are getting started uh, and who run into issues, what would be a practical example of something that you would ask on a forum or directly to the people from the ABCD study, for example, or what would be a question that you would post on Twitter to ask a wider audience? Yeah, yeah. so I can tell you when we first tried to download the ABCD data uh, in 2018, um, we ran into issues right away just on um, thinking back that far some some aspects of what was reported on how to download the data and scripts to use um weren't they were, they were pretty hard to follow and and hard to implement so we directly emailed people at abcd and uh, within within a day <laughs> we received an email back answering our question and then we there was, there was a dialogue so we set up a call with with people at NIMH responsible for ABCD and they helped us implement things and they were really uh, great to work with. So I, I mean that's the first example that comes to mind and it, it, and it started right away. So that, that's an example. I think um, things like Twitter can be useful for a variety of things, but I'm trying to think of what I've asked. Um, yeah, if I, I think um, Twitter is great for instances where what you expected to get versus what you actually have, if those differ, it can be useful to ask if other people in the field have experienced that. Um, so for example, if you were expecting 5,000 subjects from ABCD and you only have 2,000, <laughs> that might be like a good thing to, to pose for the community. Um, or if there's a specific um, discrepancy in task timing, for example, or just things like that. If what's reported to what you have if, if those things don't align. I think maybe it's useful to see if other people are having the same issue or if maybe that's something in your own lab that is just an issue because of like a user error, for example. So I, I that's what comes to mind right away. Perfect. Yeah, I think those are really useful examples. And well, I have to say I'm still relatively new to Twitter, so I'm mostly a reader but not really <laughs> actively participating. But I think um, it can also feel a bit lonely if you have this huge data set that you know has great data, but you just don't know how you can go about it. And it's really good that people are aware that Twitter then can be uh, a social media platform that they can use to get help from others and just ask questions. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really nice. Yeah. If I also may, I have a question that might be a bit, uh, well, mean may, maybe a strong word, but but going towards mean. So um, at the end of your talk, you talked about uh, data decay. So for example, the ETNI data set that is maybe now starting to overfit because so many people have analyzed the data. And I was wondering, um, would you then even go as far as to say that we should stop analyzing these data sets? Should there be a maximum of people working with one data set or a maximum number of questions that is uh, answered with one data set? Yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I I will say this, I, I don't think so. I think it's useful to have lots of people asking lots of different questions and you know thinking about things and I think yeah, I think absolutely people should still consider working at these data and doing stuff absolutely. But I, I think I think more so that the message there, at least to me, is be aware of the potential impact of that as a researcher in the field who's who's probably working with the same data. And just keep that in mind with respect to generalizability and just how you interpret findings and the context of analyses. I think that's what I would say. I, but yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I you know, I don't know if that's that's just the first answer that comes to mind. I'm sure that maybe there is a best answer there in terms of like what's best for the field, but I, I think it's still useful to have lots of people playing with data and finding cool stuff out. <laughs> 
Well, at least that's the most uh, uh, optimistic answer that yeah, we can exactly. take. <laughs> and then we can all be safe and continue right. to do our work. Continue but yeah, it. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I think, like you said in your talk as well, this is especially something that we uh, sh should still keep on collecting new data and validating the results that we get from the data set that might be drained uh, in other data sets or complementing them. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I will say, I mean, the, the, the training opportunity is, I think is, is great and I'll use my own experience. I, my first two papers were um, on HCP data, or open source data, HCP and some other samples from core. And um, yeah, and now that I'm running my own study and collecting data, it it has just enriched my PhD in a way that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> so I, I, I think it can feel discouraging to when there are these amazing resources with thousands and thousands of subjects to have be running a somewhat smaller end study. But I, I think it's it's a great training thing. It's good for the open science ecosystem if those data sets are then shared. You know, I think it's, I think it's a really great thing to, to still do. Thanks. Um, Lorenza, do you have any closing questions? Otherwise, I I have a nice um, one now, I think. <laughs> I was wondering, following this, um, yeah. like how do you, you know, we already have spent a lot of time and resources into collecting these large open data sets. And of course, you know, it's always useful to collect more data, but I suppose there is also some sort of um, limit there in terms of what we can do. And instead of, um, for instance, let's say we have ABCD um, at the moment, would you then, uh, for instance, suggest to take um, a large portion of ABCD that already has sufficient power to, to detect a specific, uh, to examine a specific effect, and then try to replicate in the remaining part of ABCD instead of looking at the whole ABCD set? And this is, of course, dividing by site. Sure, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's an effective approach. Um, just yeah, train like discovery samples and then replication samples with within a data set for sure. Um, that's yeah, a way to aid generalizability. I think also, um, but like I talked like I talked about having multiple open source samples as f for your analyses to ensure that the general kind of pattern that you're seeing is consistent. There, there might be specific data set, like data set differences due to aspects of the sample, but hopefully if generalizability is something you're after, you would see a similar pattern. So yeah, I think that those are ways to, to hopefully enhance generalizability. Yeah, for sure. All right, then I think I just received a nice uh, closing question. And that reads, um, do you think big data or machine learning is is the future trend for neuroscience? <laughs> I, I think um, that big data and machine learning are going to become more and more important. And I, wow, that is a, that is a good question. Yeah, um, I think that there are lots of ways to do good science. And I think that there are lots of ways to produce effective, cool, generalizability, generalizable findings. Um, I have taken sort of like a machine learning big data approach to my PhD, but I think that, yeah, as a field, there are lots of think cool things we can do. I think, yeah, just with the advent of just machine learning, even outside of neuroimaging, I think it's going to become more and more important for people to become familiar with that sort of work and also with big data. But I, there are really cool examples of things you can do with small samples, you know, or, or even like with um, extensively studied individuals or like deep phenotyping approaches, you know. So I think this is just one particular sort of approach, but there are lots of cool approaches that that all of us should be aware of and hopefully utilize in ways to help us do good research. Yeah. 
Thanks. I, I was sort of assuming that this question would end us on a very nice note where uh, we could say that both very large neuroimaging data sets and the smaller neuroimaging data sets are very much useful uh, to get us further uh, or to improve our knowledge. Yeah, yep. that's great. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, then I think uh, our time for this session is up. So uh, thanks a lot, Corey, for being here with us today and answering all of our questions. It was really a brilliant session. And of course, also big thanks for uh, all our attendees who are here with us today. And don't forget uh, the 30th of March at 1230 GMT, we'll have our next session from Teresa Vega on racism in statistics. Thanks all and uh, hope to see you the 30th. Bye. Bye.